Heartbeat Alaska would like to thank Cognac Incorporated. Without their support, this show would not be possible. And for their generous support, Heartbeat Alaska would also like to thank Browns Electric for helping make our show possible. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Comtech Business Systems Incorporated. One, two, three, four, let's go. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. I Heartbeat Alaska. chair and enjoy the show. Hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Jeannie's show. It's the alley you the Indian and the Eskimo. It's the alley the Indian and the Eskimo. Welcome one, welcome all. Hello everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News. Native Information, I'm Jeannie Green. Hello Canada, nice to have you with us. On today's program, we travel to the second largest island in America. You may have heard of it, it's Kodiak Island. Kodiak Island, where the alluded culture is experiencing a resurgence using high technology, such as in this CD. Using this CD to save this ancient language. Find out how as we travel to Kodiak, Alaska. Thousands of years ago, Alaska's first settlers came from Asia. Exactly how they got here is still being hotly debated. Some say they came by boat, island hopping along the Aleutian chain. Some say they walked across the Bering Sea during an ice age when the sea levels were lower. The lower sea levels left the shallow Bering Sea high and dry, exposing what's come to be called the Bering Land Bridge. After the settling around Alaska, these people adapted the rhythms of their lives to their surroundings. Their food, clothing, and shelter all came from the land and the sea. The people who settled in along the coast of south-central Alaska and Kodiak Island became known as Alutik. Geologically speaking, Kodiak Island is an extension of the Kenai Peninsula, the mountain ridges of both areas generally run northeast to southwest. Though it is close to many of the volcanoes on the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak is not volcanic. Kodiak rides on the edge of the subduction zone where the Pacific Plate slips under the North American Plate. This area experiences more earthquakes than the rest of the lower 48 states combined. For thousands of years, the voices of Aleutic people echoed along these beaches. Then, a new group of immigrants came. This time, we know exactly how they arrived. Sven Hawkinson, Jr. is the executive director of the Aleutic Museum in Kodiak. Well, according to Shelikov, when he came in 1784, he said there was 50,000 Aleutic people. I mean, we figured he probably exaggerated, but you figure, okay, minus, you know, 80% of that you still have anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people living here on Kodiak alone. And that's a huge population. Um, you know, the population here on Kodiak Island today is between 10 and 15,000 um, people. So when R Russians first came, that was, that's how many people were here then. The first white settlers on Kodiak were Russians looking for sea otter pelts. They originally founded uh, the settlement in 1784 at Three Saints Bay, and then 
Subsequently, there was um, it wasn't a good strategic location, and so Baranov moved the uh, city, moved uh, actually the Russian settlement to here, to uh, the city of Kodiak. And so subsequently, within I'd say 80 years, there's only 1,900 Alutic people left. So 80 percent of the population was wiped out. And um, disease and enslavement, I mean, the initial contact with Shelikov and then Baranov. Yeah, because they used them to hunt, kayak, um, hunt uh, for furs. And, you know, the people in Russia had no idea what was happening. Island's population, traditional Aleutic culture quickly eroded. Money replaced traditional bartering. Wanda Price from Old Harbor explains how this regalia used to symbolize great wealth. The top part that you see is the headpiece for a traditional native woman. And these symbols, the more beads you had, you were the more wealthy you were. And the traditional way, the Aleutic way, is your eyes are covered. Women were never allowed to look up. Your eyes had to be covered. You always had to look down. And the, like I said, the, this, let's say this headpiece, that would be a chief's wife because of all the design. They'd trade beads. They'd get um, the birds. Everything would be handmade. Everything would be traditional, made out of seal, um, sinew ivory, whale, and the bird's beaks. The regalia this, that she is wearing right now is a traditional woman's regalia made out of rabbit, fox, weasel, and the same meaning with the headpiece. The more beads, the more ivory, the more decorations you had, the wealthier you were. And the drums we have were made out of seal hide and the bark of the trees and the strings would be made out of sinew. So everything was all natural. Nothing was wasted. As a ludic art became less valued among the Aleutic people, the Russians found a market for it. The museums of Europe, Russia, and America. Currently, the best artifacts from Kodiak and other places in Alaska are thousands of miles away, scattered among museums all around the world. As disease and enslavement tightened their grip on the island, many of the villages around Kodiak disappeared. The voices of children ceased to echo around many of Kodiak's valleys and beaches. Today, there is a renaissance of native culture on this island. One of its more visible symbols is this. The Aleutic Museum. The museum was one of the few good things to come out of the shameful Exxon Valdez oil spill of 1989. Funds from that settlement helped build this institution. In the 10 years since the museum opened its doors, it has become the nucleus for the effort to reconstruct a ludic culture. One of the most visible symbols of any culture is its language. The Aleutic language on the edge of extinction is today receiving the attention it deserves. Sheldon Jackson came in and they wanted to implement English only policies and that's starting from the 1900s. Um, so from 1910 on, the education was English only. Um, at the time, the Russians had 
um, Alutic language and grammar and Russian language and grammar in the schools. Um, so they were teaching two different languages. Um, and then when the Americans came, they were like, no, have, we'll have none of that, English only. Um, you know, my parents and, you know, my uncles tell stories of how they were um, spanked for speaking our language. And now, now it's like 30 years later, they're turning it around saying, oh, let's teach the language when most of the people that did speak the language are gone. There's less than probably 100 speakers on the island of Alutic. And so we have very, uh, a very small population of fluent Alutic speakers. Welcome to the Alutic Museum's Language Center. Well, maybe center is kind of an ambitious word for two desks in the back corner of the museum, but saving a language has to begin somewhere. Why not here? And why not by people like April Lectonin Counselor? Um, we like to call it a center, but really it's just a shared desk kind of around a corner here. Um, we like to try to think that we're pretty important, even though we're starting out very, very small. Right now, for the whole Lutic language here on Kodiak Island, we only have two people working. Um, we're hoping, after getting an ANA grant, which is the Administration for Native Americans, uh, to start an actual language revitalization program, which will be a series of, or a number of masters and apprentices in the different villages and also here in Kodiak. This is my very tattered Lutic dictionary. Li Chikwang, I will learn. The sharing words. CD-ROM. This CD-ROM is located um, on our kiosk in our gallery, so people who visit the Alutic Museum can use it. It's also going to be available on the internet, so people who either don't have funds available to purchase a set um, or they just don't have a computer that um, can use a set in this way, they can just access it through the internet. The poster is on there as well, um, and that's through the Alutic Museum website, which is www.aluticmuseum.com, all one word. Um, and basically, the goal of this project is to try to get this information out to as many people as possible. We're not interested in making money. Uh, we did have the, the project funded by ConocoPhillips Alaska. Um, but we, our main goal is to kind of encourage a museum without walls. We want people outside the museum, people who never even enter the gallery, to be able to access the information that we're trying to share. Um, particularly the cultural information that is included with the Aleutic Word of the Week because the Aleutic Word of the Week doesn't just have an Aleutic word and an Aleutic sentence. It contains a wealth of information about the culture because every single word contains a cultural lesson along with it. Um, we also just have a number of other fun features on the CD such as the Aleutic elder Phyllis Peterson singing a couple of Aleutic songs and that's been really popular with the kids. They love to come into the gallery and click on that and make her sing over and over again. <laughs> so that's been interesting. <laughs> it's called Nahasta, which is the Laos song. Um, and basically, we think this song came from the fact that, you know, a long time ago there was a lot of skins and, and various other kinds of animal products that would be in people's homes. And so problems such as lice and fleas would kind of plague people. And this is kind of a mocking song which kind of makes fun of people's own discomfort about having, you know, such uncomfortable little creatures kind of cohabiting with them in their homes. So the song itself is about a louse that's taking a banya with its little baby louse, which is a, you know, a knit <laughs> or whatever. Um, and they're just kind of singing and switching themselves in the banya and the baby's splashing water on the rocks and the adult louse is just kind of singing to himself and switching himself and having a good time. So it's just kind of making fun of the whole situation that people used to kind of suffer um, long ago in our history. And then you'll be kind of welcomed to the CD-ROM by this song that I mentioned of the Kodiak Alutic dancers. Um, there's kind of words floating across the screen of different Alutic words. There's chamai, which means hello, lampak, which is a lamp, 
ahwak, a whale. Um, these are just words that are introduced to people when they're using this CD. After you've seen the CD a couple times, you might decide to skip the intro. So you can go ahead and click on that, and it'll bring you to the main menu page. The first main component out of the five major components of this CD is kind of a foreword talking about the Aleutic language. If you click on that, it brings you to just a discussion of where the language comes from. There's a map. It talks about the Eskimo Aleut language tree, where Aleutic fits in relation to the various other native languages in Alaska. As you can see here, Aleutic is most closely related to Central Yupik, which is like, for example, in the Bethel region. Um, but it's not as closely related to Aleut as most people would assume. So that's a big thing to remember. Um, and there's also a language map that shows many of the traditional Lutic villages in the area. So you can go to a different section, for example, the consonants for Q. Kaduk is rain. So this just goes through the alphabet, breaking the letters down into different groups like vowels, consonants, sounds we already know, which are sounds that are exactly like what we have in English. You can say, how are you? And then it also says how to say, I am good, or I am bad. <laughs> um, and then there's also in this list, I love you. Um, Kusuwamkin, I miss you. We have a number of different elders that have let us use their voices for this. One of them is Elder Nicol Oakley, who I'm also learning Alutic from. Um, that's his picture up there. Florence Pesterkoff, we have a number of recordings from her. She was one of the early voices that we used on the Alutic Word of the Week. We also have Nadia Mullen, um, and then also Phyllis Peterson. They were some of the different elders that helped on this. Um, if you wanted to get a little bit more beyond just saying a couple of words, and learning how to sound out the letters, you could go to the grammar section. Um, because the Aleutic language is based a lot on suffixes, you can have a whole sentence that's just one word. And it might be a really, really long word, but that's because you're adding a bunch of different suffixes to the end of one, you know, the original subject word. So that's, that's pretty interesting to me as somebody learning the language. If people don't want to go that far, they can just avoid that section, because it gets pretty technical. Um, then we also have another, this is another major section of the CD. This is the Aleutic Word of the Week section. If people are interested in more learning about culture, they can click on the English word, and that will bring them to a lesson about that word in Aleutic culture. Um, for instance, we're, we've just clicked on baby, and it says that babies in Aleutic families are considered a sign of good luck, um, and women would give birth to babies with the help of a midwife or a healer. Um, and another important point that's mentioned here is that um, Aleutic women often would take a banya or sweat bath in preparation for giving birth to a baby. Um, there's also another song about um, a guduk. Um, and it's also another humorous song. And once you hear these a couple times, you just have them memorized. It's, it's pretty funny. Yeah, she's she's just great. Um. With the Sharing Word CD just a few months old. Sven Hawkinson, Jr. stumbled upon a rare opportunity to bring home to Kodiak a beautiful piece of their culture, and it was almost an impossible task. The, the history of this spruce root hat, uh, for the last 60 years, was at the Calvin's house in Sitka. Um, originally, it was in their kitchen. And then they put it in a uh, storage box or a uh, trunk. Um, and then in 1999, Steve uh, uh, Hendricks of the Alaska State Museum went over to visit um, the family, and they told him about it. And he, he's got a wonderful story about how excited he was when he realized what the hat was, when they found it. And then 
from there they let the, the family um, let them take it to the State Museum where it was from 1999 up until this year 2004 um, when the family decided that um, since the State Museum couldn't raise enough money they wanted to put it up for auction and in the summer um, it went to Bonhams and Butterfields from there uh, you know, when we originally found out about the hat, uh, we were, you know, kind of shocked about the price because the appraisal value of this hat here is one hundred thirty-five to one hundred seventy-five thousand um, dollars. But thanks to Anchorage Museum, um, the director uh, Pat Wolf approached me and said, "Look, um, uh, we can contribute up to seventy-six thousand dollars. What can you do?" And so what I then did is I worked with the native corporations um, and private individuals. Um, over the next four months, three months actually, um, three months of talking, but three weeks of actual fundraising, uh, we were able to raise $220,000 to bid, to use as bidding potential. Uh, from there, um, it was kind of the rest is history type thing, where we went to Anchorage Museum, had a private uh, auctioneer, he went and helped us bid for it, and we got it, but then the wonderful thing about this hat is it tells a story of, you know, the rich history of our island, what you, our ancestors used to wear and had, but also how important our heritage is, is to us today. Um, thanks to the Native Corporations, thanks to Ed Rasmussen, thanks to the Anchorage Museum, we now have this piece. We can share this knowledge and continue passing this knowledge on. Instead of going over to Europe where most of these hats exist, um, we now have one here in our own museums in Alaska. After over a hundred years, the hat is back on Kodiak Island. And with a flourish, Sven gives the public their first peek. So here's the hat. And I want to thank all of you guys for coming. What we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to open the hat up here, but then um, we have refreshments in the back. And then from there, um, we're going to also have Russian Orthodox starring, which are, they're going to be coming here in about a half hour or so. Um, so if you guys want to go and eat and then come back out for the starring, it would be wonderful. Um, but please enjoy the hat and, uh, you know, something new for us. <laughs> The Anchorage Museum of History and Art and the Aleutic Museum are quite possibly the only museums in the country that jointly own an artifact. Bringing the hat back home was truly a team effort, Alaska style. But the unveiling isn't the only celebration in Kodiak this evening. Besides becoming the new home of this rare spruce hat, the Aludic Museum is also the first stop on the first night of starring, a Russian Orthodox Christmas tradition in which groups of locals visit different houses singing carols and enjoying food and good company. In addition to the carolers is one person honored with the task of spinning a decorated star, symbolizing the beacon the three wise men followed to Bethlehem upon hearing of the birth of Christ. For those of you curious about a January Christmas, Russian Orthodox tradition celebrates all holy days in accordance with the old Julian calendar, in which dates occur a bit later than they do in our more familiar Gregorian calendar. In a time when the Russian fur traders were exploiting the Aleutic people, the Russian Orthodox Church brought hope. Priests learned the Aleutic language. They created a written form of Aleutic and translated scripture. To this day, Russian Orthodox churches are carefully maintained all over the island. The unique traditions are still a central part of village life on the island. This magnificent island has seen a lot of changes in the past 200 years. The Aleutic culture almost vanished, 
But with tireless effort and dedication, the Aleutic people are keeping their culture alive. It's hard to say what this island will look like in another 100 years or 200 years, but hopefully the songs of the Aleutic people will still echo off these majestic mountainsides. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cognac Incorporated, for making this story possible, because we could not have gone to Kodiak without your sponsorship. Thank you, Aludic Museum and the Anchorage Museum of History and Art. In fact, thank you, everyone responsible for bringing the Spruce Root hat back home. And thank you for joining us. I'm Jeannie Green. Join me again next week, won't you, for more Heartbeat Alaska, where we travel to remote villages and share the stories of people that live there. We'll see you next week. To purchase a copy of this program, have your credit card ready and call area code 907-563-7440 or send a check or money order for $20 to 6250 Tuttle Place, number 5, in Anchorage, Alaska, 99507. Ask for the program listed below. Da dan gong mama lo alu da kuna kutu te ku ku akai lo ni Yeah.